Hello, and welcome everyone today to the Implementing, Scaling, and Governing AI Solutions for the Trucking and Logistics Industry, presented by Faxban. I am your host. I am Solomon Williams. I am VP of Data Transformation, Analytics, and AI for Faxban Consulting, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Abaram Manjad. Abaram, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, Solomon. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure hosting this alongside you. Hi, everyone. My name is Abiram. I go by Abhi. I lead the Europe business for Faxpan. I'm based here in London, and it's a real privilege to be hosting this webinar on this very interesting topic for something that we are really passionate about. Uh, Solomon, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the reasons why we at Faxpan wanted to really present this webinar specifically for the trucking and logistics industry is because we truly believe in our experience that it is a grossly underserved industry. Trucking and logistics, as we know, is literally what moves our goods and products across the face of the globe. And with the ever shrinking economy becoming more of a global economy and globally connected to one another, when we begin to look at AI solutioning and all the hype around AI, how do you make it pragmatic? Because the trucking and logistics industry is nothing but pragmatic. It has to be efficient, it has to be clean, and it has to be value driven. In the nature of the market today, particularly in trucking and logistics, it is highly competitive. Would you go to the next slide, please? One of the things that obviously that you see is the trucking industry and logistics industry is inundated with challenges, whether it's regulatory, whether it's environmental, whether they are disruptions in the supply chain. The, the trucking industry is constantly on the lookout for what's coming next. What is that next challenge that we have to overcome? Next slide, please. And in doing so, uh, the deluge of regulations and new mandates that are coming about and how these regulators are challenging how, you know, the trucking and logistics industry operates from the shippers through the movement of goods, the consignees, how the brokers and the trucker and the trucking companies interrelate with one another. They have to operate in this environment with the host of regulatory bodies, whether it's Department of Transportation, Occupational Self and Administration, EPA, Customs and Border Protection, National Highway Safety. There is no ending to the regulations that are coming and these regulations are challenging every aspect of trucking and logistics. Next slide, please. And to that line, how do you do that and survive in the market? Now, again, trucking logistics always been competitive. However, here's a few statistics that you know may not you know be largely known. That as our as of 2022, approximately 1.9 million trucking companies in the United States alone, and this proliferation is driven by a low barrier of entry. I have the money, I'm gonna go buy a truck. I'm gonna go buy a trailer. Anybody can join into this industry. And this proliferation of competition, what's happened is it's put the customer uh, in control of now I have multiple choices, I can go anywhere. And it puts pressures on rates and it puts pressures, it depresses in some regions uh, the availability to get higher rates and drive margins. Now, when you break it apart, that 1.9 million, what you find is that the uh, those uh, large operators, global operators that have 20 trucks or more are only 2.6% of the market. And the those with seven to 20 trucks, 5.9%. So that means that 91.5% of the remainder of the truck have less than six trucks, six trucks or less. And that is where the fiercest competitions exist. And that competition is among contract spot loads, being able to drive uh, greater rates. How do you get the most operational efficiency, asset management? All of those factors are putting so much pressure and again, that 97.4% is not only battling the hundreds of carriers in that one region for the same dollar, but the bigger challenge is that dollar has a lot less net revenue. 
And so what it's forcing the industry to do is how can we become as lean and efficient as possible with the shrinking of freight, the shrinking of rates, the higher regulatory mandates, the disruptions in the supply chain. How do we become more efficient? And Faxman Consulting has developed and built long-standing relationships in the trucking logistics industry, helping them do just that. Next slide, please. So uh, this is no secret. Skyrocketing, skyrocketing operating costs. The external factors, you know, are myriad. Uh, the national driver shortage, I know there's a lot of debate on this. Is there a driver shortage? Is there not a driver shortage? Uh, is it that the drivers are held to higher standards? But I'm not really going to debate that topic, but it is forcing higher wages. Uh, you have more advanced technologies and complex technologies that we had to contend with that we didn't have just five years ago. Uh, there's an erratic customer demand where the demand in different regions is spiking unbeknownst to a lot of carriers and a lot of logistics providers, and they have to be prepared and have assets and equipment in those areas to serve for that demand piece. Higher fuel costs, higher maintenance costs, all of these things. And what that drives is you see here from where we have on the left, the higher operations costs, this creates a vicious cycle where you have fewer drivers driving longer routes, higher driver wages mean higher fuel costs, the complex and less profitable routes are proliferating and then higher maintenance costs due to reduced preventative care. And every time we go through this cycle, it becomes more expensive at each point. And so this cycle continues. So again, these operating costs, again, no secret, but how are we falling victim to it is one of the things that we wanted to highlight. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so there is no quick fix to these systemic issues. We know that there's no silver bullet. There's no magic wand that can be waved. You know, whether it's the regulatory challenges, the market fluctuations, as you can see here, technology evolution, there's a litany of these issues, but how do we address them? How do we stand and maintain competitiveness? And again, how do we do it in such a way that serves for both, both external factors and internal factors. And that is an integrated strategy. We need to decrease the friction to increase the velocity and revenue recognition internally. And externally, how do we sharpen our approach to slice through these headwinds and obstacles to stay competitive and become leaders in that market? And again, that's what we're here today to talk about. Next slide, please. There are a number of popular areas targeted for AI solutions, uh, whether that's intelligent route planning, fuel efficiency, these are uh, the, the table stakes for a competitive trucking and logistics company today. And it, the, these are great areas. And this is why this is not just about the technical implementation, but also from a business perspective, again, practicality and pragmatic, how do we do this in a way that is actually going to add immediate near-term value. But with looking at this, the next thing we're gonna, we're gonna show you is the supply chain. Uh, Faxband Consulting has been working again in trucking and logistics for many, many years. And this is an illustrative view. You know, your company might be a little different, but across the trucking and logistics industry, this supply chain is where we've actively partnered with our uh, trucking logistics partners to actually help develop solutions, develop AI uh, driven solutions, whether it's sales and marketing or procurement, freight management, all the way through order management and pricing, inventory. And one of the things that is bearing in mind is that when you look at all of the areas that are prime for AI enhancement, AI driven solutions, one of the bigger challenges we see is the companies try a scattershot approach. Oh, we're gonna do these five, we're gonna do these six. And the challenge is that it leads to competing priorities, prototypes, resources, and funding. Let's just show you this example with one use case, asset management. 
So we're going to do asset management optimization. And that is a great area wherein it brings an opportunity to manage equipment, manage our fleet, manage costs, and actually drive revenue. But the next time when you actually dig into it, you're pulling information from across the value chain, SMEs from across the value chain. And specifically when AI-driven solutions, AI-driven solutions are going to change the way you work. They will change the way you communicate. They will change the way you operate. So you might look at this and say, oh, well, asset uh, management optimization is a key use case we wanna leverage be mindful that the use case is not enough. When you are beginning, whether it's your first initiative or whether you're several initiatives in, you need to begin thinking through your strategy and how your AI strategy is going to support it. And we're not talking about a giant Taj Mahal, something that you can hang on the wall with, with 90 pages or 90 slides. No, but it's much more pragmatic than that, but it is critical to think through how that impact of this AI enabled solution is going to uh, impact across the value chain and how you are going to align that to the various components of a strategy. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna talk about logistics and the impact. And with that, Abiram, I'm gonna uh, present this to you. If you would take us through the uh, global logistics impact, please. Thank you, thank you, Solomon. So so far, what, what you've been talking about is specifically for trucking and the kind of regulatory and internal set of challenges that, that the industry has seen, and they are plenty by themselves. But what I want to do here is take a further global perspective. And the way I understand or say the way we've seen the logistics industry evolve is there are two key trends, right? So one, one trend is there's a globalization trend, of course, which which means that uh, the logistics or say the supply chains across territories, across geographies are all interconnected. And whenever there is a disruption at a global scale, of course, things go for a toss. And the other bit is there is also a trend of regionalization where a lot of regions are self-sufficient, which means that they have their own whole nine yards or the entire value chain is covered within that region, right from manufacturing to distribution to all forms of logistics. But even there, we are seeing some challenges. I want to present two perspectives here. So the first perspective, and I don't want to uh, sound very morbid, but right from 2020 till date, the world has seen a lot of disruption. We've seen, I mean, this is just an indicative timeline. Uh, it's not even, uh, you know, it doesn't even capture everything that has happened in terms of what could potentially have gone wrong, uh, you know, across a set of events, whether it is geopolitical events, whether it's economic events, whether it's just nature playing its its course, right? So it's a combination of things that has hit the world. And the interesting bit is no industry, no single industry gets impacted by all of these events as much as this industry does. Yes, there could be industries which are more impacted by one event of these. For example, COVID-19, of course, the pharmaceutical industry is impacted the heaviest, the medical industry is impacted the heaviest. But across all of these events, is there a single industry which is impacted? Yes, and that's the logistics industry. And that is where it is becoming so critical that that industry gains attention and we try to solve, solve things around it. Uh, one may feel it's just moving goods from one, one person to another, but no, it's making the movement of goods from the right place to the right place, to the right person, in time, in the right time, and in the right condition, right? So all of these factors make it make it all the more critical. So this is the global view. Likewise, there's a regional view, right? So on the regional perspective as well, there have been so many disruptions in different parts of the world that those respective local supply chains, those respective local areas are impacted. And what this leads to is that we as an industry or say we as servers to this industry, we see disruption is the new norm. It's not that disruption is an exception, it's disruption for this industry is the new normal because each such disruption is going to impact pricing, it's going to impact you know, transportation costs, fuel costs and whatnot, right? So in such times of disruption, and it's, it's going to continue like this. I mean, we are not seeing things drastically change. So it's going to continue like this and how does this industry thrive in all of this disruption is that's where 
the power of AI analytics and data comes in. Because using these, we can bring some form of predictability to the industry. We can bring some form of resilience to the industry by making things digital. So that's the that's where our focus is. Now, what I'm going to do is give you a perspective, and you've touched upon this, Solomon, in, in when you when you talked about the supply chain, the, the overall value chain for logistics. But here are some examples of actual use cases that we have been working on with the larger logistics players as well. So while we have been dealing with the trucking industry and the smaller set of players, relatively smaller set of players, we are also dealing with the largest of players where we are dealing with pricing optimizations, we are dealing with order handling, we are looking at improving terminal operations by the usage of data, real-time insights. We are looking at route optimization. Route optimization is one of my most favorite use cases because it's like the traveling salesman problem, the classic traveling salesman problem on steroids, right? Where you've got so many variables at play and how do you best, best utilize those all those variables to come up with the most optimum routes. So those are the kind of use cases that, that we are solving. The impact on the carbon footprint, again, a huge area for the logistics world as to how do we ensure that while we operate things efficiently, as well as while we are resilient, we are not overdoing on in terms of the carbon footprint impact that we create. So it is across all of these use cases that we have been building solutions, we have been implementing some of these for our clients. And what I would want to do is give a very quick glimpse of some of these, right? So let's look at the... Again, my favorite use case is route optimization use case. Now, what you're seeing on screen is a very simple UI, right? It's it's just a, um, it's like a simplistic version of an actual use case that we are solving. So here we are dealing with three variables, just three variables. It's the warehouses, the number of warehouses that the, let's say a client would have, the number of customers that the warehouses is going to going to address and the number of containers in each warehouse. It's just these very simple, these three parameters. Just the combination of these three parameters leads us to several combinations of what sort of routes can these containers take or should these containers take to make the most optimal deliveries and to ensure that there is very limited wastage of resources and wastage of fuel, et cetera. So we have been working with uh, some of our clients to actually extrapolate this to, to a much larger scale within cities, across cities, how do we ensure that? And it's just these three variables right now, but there could be types of containers, there could be weather and climate impact. We overlay this, what you're seeing is just mathematical coordinates of these different routes. But what we will, we typically overlay this is with geospatial data and come up with those routes, which are then automatically fed to these, these trucking companies or say the, the overall, you know, end points of, of these containers. So that's one example. Again, it's a it's a session in itself if we go deeper. So I would love our audience to, if they find this interesting, we'll be happy to conduct this as a as a separate session and we'll deep dive with them as we go along. The second Abra, use case, if I might, yes, before yes, you yes, just come course. on. Of course. Uh, yeah. One of the things I would like for you just to highlight as well, that this is fantastic, but you've also extrapolated this into freight management, into loading optimization, into transportation optimization. I mean, this one route planning that I know you did for one of our one of the largest um, logistics firms in the world is that to your point, it can take numerous variables for route Absolutely. planning, but can also be used for freight planning or load planning as well. I just wanted to make sure that our audience knew that as well. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, very, very valid call out, uh, Solomon. So we the, the use case the, the is such that it can it can scale up and scale down and the complexity can, can vary. But the impact that it has and the kind of, I mean, it's a common use case across whether you're a small player or a large player, this can... The, the number of variables is what will vary, but the use case is still very, very relevant. Thank you. Sorry, please continue. Yeah. The the second bit, again, a very, very relevant use case for everybody in this industry is the whole uh, getting visibility of how things are happening. So we call this the terminal ops cockpit. And these are a set of KPIs that we have been building with some of our clients. So we have now access to 
the right kind of KPIs that are relevant, something that will truly impact business. And these are just some sample views for our audience to understand what this looks like. So I've just collated three views just for our for our, for for us to get a feel out of this. And again, we can go deeper into a into a demo cons into a demonstration at, at the back of this webinar. But the first view is a yard view. So let's say uh, as a terminal operations manager, I want to get a sense of what's the, what does the yard look like? Where could potentially my containers fit in? What are the open slots? Where are high priority containers as against other containers? So all of that is visually available. And as you can see, there's a there's a play of IoT here. So there are there's all of this is sensor data getting getting fed to certain systems, and then that data getting updated here in real time, right? So that's that's the first view. Second one, again, for the trucking industry, very relevant is what we call the truck turnaround time as a KPI. So we are we are able to track this in terms of what's the truck turnaround time, how do we optimize it? How do we ensure that the at the right efficiency and the right speeds with the right level of safety do trucks come in and out of the, the overall warehouse setups, right? So that's that's another parameter that we that we track. The third bit that we track is uh, equipment. So while there are trucks and you know the actual vehicles that that move around, uh, there's a major component are the heavy machinery equipments, the the cranes and you know whatnot that you use in a warehouse or around the the overall uh, warehouse sites. And how are those being utilized? Are they available for the next batch to come in and so on? So all of this is again real time, dynamic, uh, sensor based. And all of that gets fed into what are what we call as consumable dashboards for the terminal operations managers across devices. So that's another very interesting solution, very effective and something that is very relevant across the spectrum, whether you are a small or a large player. So we, I just wanted to, like you said, uh, you've got your regulatory challenges, all the you know uh, local set of challenges that that they are dealing with. The second bit of challenges is the challenges at a global scale. And across these, we have solutions and specific use cases that we are going to cover as a part of you know, what we offer to our clients. Excellent, excellent. One of the things that I see here is, and now we begin to hopefully for our audience to see that the opportunity for higher uh, efficiency for more efficient operations, which actually drives real near-term revenue is uh, can be situated in the AI solution space. And these um, are just a sampling. These are just a sampling of some of the solutions that we look at when for FactSpan, when we look at the traffic, the trucking and uh, transportation logistics industry, it really is that that trucking, that freight forwarding, that port manager, warehouse manager, 3PLs, 4PLs, warehouse managers, supply chain, man. we have been working in this industry and are the leading partner in the trucking and transportation industry. And one of the things that I just wanted to call out with Abaram took us through is that this is not platform dependent. This, you don't have to buy this platform or that platform or invest in this. We are a solutions provider. And that's what we do. Data management, analytics, and AI. We provide these solutions regardless of the platform you've invested in. Regardless of the, whether it's an Amazon or an Azure or a Manugistics or a web, whichever of the logistics tools uh, and warehouse management tools, WMS, TMS systems that you use, SAP, what have you, we work in these environments to bring these solutions together for the benefits of our clients. Indeed, indeed. If you would. Yes, absolutely. And just to move along, right? So we, the, especially today, I think everybody in our audience is, the reason why they are attending this is because everybody's has interest in AI and we all know how how interesting this topic has become. There's everybody who wants to implement AI and we get a lot of interest from clients who are trying to do uh, pockets of pilots and POCs, et cetera. But the true value of AI and of everything that we have discussed comes when we, when we take it to a certain scale. So what I would like you Solomon to do now is while we've seen some, a glimpse of the solutions I want you to go a little deeper into what it actually takes to implement these solutions at scale at a certain pace, right? So let's let's hear from you. Indeed, and thank you for that. 
And that is really now that we get into the heart of it, which is how do you do it? How do you make it pragmatic? How do you make it efficient? And, you know, one of the things that we advise our clients when you're beginning to make that investment in AI, when you're approaching AI solutions, you have to understand that a lot fail, many fail. And when they don't fail, they end up with either disconnected solutions or simply they just abandon them uh, because they run into complexities that they weren't aware of. And one of the things that I would you know, advise, and I believe Abraham would as well, is please partner with someone. Please find a trusted partner that you can rely upon that's going to help guide you through this. As we step through the, uh, what does it take to bring these solutions to life in an environment? I really want you to, our audience to bear that in mind that, you know, how do you do this and make sure that you get a partner that you can trust to guide you through this. Uh, one of the bigger things that we see, and first of all, before I jump into that, if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, there's no need to wait to the end. Uh, we will uh, get to them in kind, but out there in the audience, any questions, any comments at all, please feel free to put them in and we will get them answered for you. That being said, uh, one of the bigger challenges is, like I said, this, this uh, it's not having multiple AI enhancement prototypes. It's, it's literally not having a strategy for implementing them, scaling them and governing them. Up. It is much more complex and there is no single platform out there that you can buy that's gonna solve for everything. You have some development AI platforms, you have some management AI platforms, you have some development management AI platforms uh, that help you develop your prototype, but none of these platforms are going to help you govern the solution. None of them are going to have you help you scale the solution. None of them are going to help you manage the actual day-to-day -day life cycle or the data management aspect of it. And that's why having a strategy for your solution, whether you're just starting out, whether you have multiple solutions in production, wherever you're at in your journey, it's important to put that, wrap a strategy around it so that you know where you're going. Uh, next slide, please. So with that being said, the rash, what is, why? Well, taking the plunge is significant. It's a significant decision. AI solutions are complex. And it's not just the architecture. Oh, do I use a transformer? Am I going to use a uh, retrieval augmented generation? Um, what type of LLM am I going to use? Am I going to use a foundational model? You know, there's a lot of the technical development aspects of it uh, with regard to how many layers of uh, nested uh, nested layers do I need? When is there, What at what point is there a diminishing return? But even at a much higher level, uh, there's a vast amount of data, regardless if you're using a pre-trained LLM or you're adapting that LLM to new questions, to new inputs, a vast amount of data is required. And you're going to require additional skill sets, not just on the technical side, but on the change management side, on the data literacy side, on the data governance side, on the business SMEs, as those uh, challenge as those demands and challenge change to be able to capture them and be able to bring them through the AI life cycle so that you can publish a new model. Uh, implementing AI solutions require a validated use case. And again, when we talk about validation, it's not, oh, here's the use case, here we can do it. Do you have the data? Do you have access to the data? Is there a robust data pipeline? Your data governance policies, your data privacy and ethics, model lifecycle management, and then there's the AI governance itself. And you're like, oh, well, you said that model lifecycle. No, there actually is a separate component when you look at managing the governance of the model and then managing the overall AI capability governance. Same way you have a chief financial officer that is not only watching the specific uh, general ledger and the revenue and accounts payable and amounts receivable, but your revenue strategy. You have somebody responsible for that. You have somebody responsible for your product strategy. You have somebody re responsible for transportation, service, and maintenance. You need to have a governing body around your AI governance and who is going to lead that.
And then when you think through implementing the AI solutions, please, not as one-offs, but as a collective approach. You may have AI prototypes in a number of different business functional areas, but how do they come together to align to the overall corporate uh, goals, the overall your overall organizational goals and objectives? How do they align to your technology strategy? How do they align to your revenue strategy, the FP&A bill? The data management, the model management, the adaptation, all of these components, when you begin to think first about here is our use case, just like you have a checklist for other strategic projects, strategic initiatives, think about how all of these are going to fit together and how they're going to work. Because that is what trips up a number of organizations when they begin conflict that, well, you know, the CEO, the executive committee, executive leadership wanted us to kick off our investment in AI, we went after it, and now you have competing priorities, competing conflicts. We have to be able to figure that out. Next slide, please. So here is an overview of the FactSpan AI uh, the implementation strategy. Now, this is just an overview, and there are numerous accelerators and components to go under, but what we wanted to share with our audience today is, again, just the high-level milestones, the long poles in the tent, because there's not just one, uh, but starting with your design thinking and how do you go about it and your culture, process, and people analysis. AI solutions are going to absolutely change the way you work, the way you operate, the way you communicate. And so it is very important to factor in the organizational culture and the people analysis and how it supports. Your data architecture, data governance, data collection, data preparation. Again, there is a huge data management component. And I cannot stress that your data quality and data governance are foundational to ensure that any of your AI solutions are valid outside of testing. And that testing itself doesn't collapse. Uh, your technology strategy alignment, your model discovery. Now, here is some uh, just some quick key points. When we talk about your model discovery and management and your AI solution lifecycle, they're different. That's a day overlap, of course, they are interrelated. Of course, but there are key aspects to those two that must be, whether you're looking at a, a new model, whether you're looking at foundational models, you're looking at leveraging LMs, if you're building your own model and what are the foundation, how are you training it? The um, How are you doing your experimentation? All of that needs to be fed with vast amounts of high quality data that is governed. And then Solomon, again, I want to I want to come in here and and please. you know I want to uh, highlight one specific point. Uh, this is what what Solomon is describing is extremely crucial and very practical when it comes to taking things at scale. And that's that's where we are focusing on because one may think that let's say if you are uninitiated on the AI journey and you want to, if you want to start something quick, you don't you don't have to of course worry of all of this on day one. No. Right? So you can, of course, start things very quick. You could do a quick pilot, but will you will you get the right kind of value just by that pilot? No, of course not. And that is where. So you may you may get to hear from, let's say, other sources or in the in the out there that experimentation is something that's quick. Of course it is, but we are here talking about scale. We are here talking about taking things to the next level. And that is exactly why we are emphasizing, why Solomon is emphasizing on all of these aspects, which may seem an overkill, but they are not. Uh, that's that's what I wanted to emphasize on. No, and no, I mean, you're spot on. And I don't want to frighten people. Oh, like, oh exactly. my God, it's so weird. Yeah. No, I don't want to frighten, yes. We uh, absolutely advocate, you know, prototyping, fail fast, get it done quick. Yeah. Absolutely. But to your point, as you're looking across the enterprise and bringing these solutions together, you want to have a strategy wrapped around it, how to do it. And this, it, again, these are tall poles in the tent, and it may seem daunting, but once you have it as part of your operation, it, it, it's, it moves very quickly. It, these are just food for thought as you're thinking through it. And this is really no different than thinking through any other strategic investment. Uh, these same aspects would be there, but yeah, I don't want to frighten people think I have to do all this before I get started. Not at all. Sure. These are just yeah. components to growing that strategy. <laughs> That's a good call. That's a good call. Uh, sure. Next slide, please. Yeah. And so again, scaling, 
key factors. Uh, again, implementing AI across your, your environment. Uh, again, how do you scale it? That's really what we're focusing on. And what we're highlighting here is, again, just these factors. We have to start with the organizational alignment. Uh, and then you look at strategic fit. How does it fit? And go to the next slide where you'll see a little bit more cleanly is what are you doing at those key points? Why are they numbered, number, uh, numbered the way they are and how they interrelate to one another? Again, what we want you to bear in mind that as you grow and as you scale and get deeper into the waters of AI, um, how do you continue to move it and grow it effectively? And how do you really turn it into a self-perpetuating engine? And that's what these key factors are intended to highlight, is just that think through it. How are we touching these things? What does it mean to your specific organization? Whether you're a freight forwarder, you're a drayage manager, you're a shipper, you're a maritime shipper, you're an air freight, you're rail, you're trucking, you're 3PL. What does this mean and how does it mean to your solutions? And where are you having difficulty in these solutions? And it might just simply be, you know what, we, we've got all that, we're good. Our biggest challenge is resourcing, which a, a lot of times it is. And that we absolutely applaud. But again, it's just wanting to help this industry take hold of this AI and really ride it and get the value and, the, uh, and reduce the challenges to it. I want to again come in here, Solomon, and I'll emphasize on the point on getting value, right? Now, one thing that we are observing as a trend in the industry is uh, the technology, the AI as a technology is proven, wherein you've got these beautiful foundational models, every model appearing, you know, one every day there's a new model that appears um, and they, they work, right? All of us know that they work. Uh, and what we are advocating here is how should they work at scale? Now, one key component there is the whole value realization of these of these AI models or you know what you build is of these AI use cases. And we really emphasize on that specific bit. So we have something called as a, a value realization calculator or say value calculator, where depending on the use case, depending on what kind of AI uh, solution are you bringing in, whether you're using LLMs or whether you're using discriminative AI of, of the traditional kind, uh, all of those factors go into this value realization framework and we qualify use cases based on that. So that the value creation is, is a key one because we should not be just enamored by new technology. Uh, we should really see whether it's truly generating that value and we truly believe it will, but it's, it's good to always calculate that with a methodical uh, framework and, and a tool which can, which can do that for us. No, absolutely. Empirical beats anecdotal any day. And that is one of the key things, again, in validating your use case and calculating the value. Uh, if we, can, if you can, as I'm sure many of our audience know, if you can demonstrate the value uh, empirically, uh, it goes a long way in making your business case. It goes a long way with getting the executive leadership team and the executive councils and CEOs and CIOs, getting them more comfortable in looking at these investments because we, let's face it, everybody and their cousin is coming out of the woodwork with, you know, an AI proposition. Oh, I got an AI, I got, I got, I got. but how do you calculate its actual value to your organization? And that yeah. accelerated it. Abram, thank you for bringing that up is a key aspect that a lot of our customers ask for. Can you help us calculate the value? And so, no, thank you. Absolutely. Great. Next slide, please. And so this is, uh, again, we've talked about the implementation um, and how do you think through the implementation? We talked about scaling and those key factors involved in scaling. Now here comes the, the anchor. How do you govern it, right? How do you govern that AI solution? And this is the framework that Faxban, we spent a many number of years. And when I say a number of years, I mean a number of years. We've been working and developing machine learning and AI solutions long before the hype cycle 
of AI came about. We've been working with uh, our leaders specifically here in trucking logistics, our partners for a number of years to help out these solutions in that mountainous move from Excel spreadsheets into digital operations and then from the digital operations in the dashboards and the reporting and now into AI driven solutions. So we have been refining this AI governance framework for a number of years. And again, number one starts with organizational alignment and then the operating model, how it's going to work within the organization, the risk and compliance, all policies, all the way through monitoring. And as you can see, in between there are the key objectives, whether it's trustworthiness, whether it's trust, whether it's transparency, whether it's safety, all of these components build on one another. This isn't just a picture. There are capabilities, there are accelerators that go under this to be able to figure out how, again, governing the solution. Now that the solution is in production and you have a pipeline and you have to feed that pipeline from your data environment into your ML and AI environment, and then how do you govern it to protect it? so that it grows, it scales, it adapts. Uh, again, because you don't wanna have to rebuild your solution every single time. You wanna have built in those building blocks that allow you to evolve it without tearing it down and building it all over again. And specifically managing risk to enhance transparency, the more transparency, the lesser the risk. It is hand in hand, the, le the more opaque, and less visibility, the greater the risk. And this AI framework allows us to, to make as transparent as possible, whether you're the business user, the business stakeholder, the technical stakeholder, the data scientists themselves, how do we make sure that transparency, that communication is there so that we have the trust and minimize the risk? I want to again come in here, Solomon, and uh, especially on the point on risk, now I'll bring in the, like, like we've been doing, let me bring in the perspective from this side of the pond. And uh, as we all know, the EU AI Act is, is at play here and it's, it's extremely significant and rightfully so. So it's, it's now here and a lot of organizations, especially the larger enterprise organizations are expected to follow that. Now, what we have done over time is evolve this framework to also consider the EU AI Act. And especially on the risk part, uh, one key component of the AI Act is about identifying the risk associated and tagging that risk, whether it is you know, a, a high risk or a low risk, or is it something that is hazardous, depending on the use case that you are addressing, right? So especially in, in this industry, for example, there could be use cases which are related to safety, which is, which is a huge component in, in this industry, particularly as against, say, other industries. And that's where the risk element becomes extremely crucial. So the, the the framework itself now has the ability to correctly tag the risk the risk levels of the different use cases that you're dealing with and accordingly not just tag them but even document the evidence around that because that's when that's that's what is going to be required from an audit compliance standpoint. So that's something that I specifically wanted to call out Solomon especially in context of the EU AI Act. No, absolutely. And we have customers globally and hope they're here list today listening. So no, I, I absolutely appreciate that. That's the point. Well, we've come to the end of our presentation. This is actually the end of our presentation. And we wanted to have an opportunity to answer some of the questions that you sent in. And uh, one of the questions that I, well, before we get to that, um, Please, if there are any questions, any comments, if you'd like a further deep dive into any of these use cases that you've seen or some of the other use cases that we have, you can reach out to me, Solomon, for the Americas, uh, North and South America, that, that Canada, that, that Central America as well, and Mexico. Um, and I'm you know, happy to engage with you for the rest of the world, my colleague, Abaram, and he literally does cross the entire rest of the world. Uh, he has that. You can reach out to him for the UK and Europe. These uh, QR codes tell you, take you directly to our LinkedIn uh, if you want to communicate that way, or you can go to the website, you can go to the email, you can absolutely reach us. We're happy to engage with you just to have a dialogue if you want, just to talk through finer points.
points, if you'd like. We're happy to engage with you. Um, again, we serve this industry because we believe in it. Uh, we are deeply invested in it. We are the leading partner in transportation, trucking transportation and logistics uh, for the solutions and the partnerships that we have. And so uh, just really want to thank you, Abraham. Is there anything that you want to say before we move to the questions? No, I think uh, I think we we have it covered. So just in summary, we looked at the challenges that the industry faces. What's the value chain like? How do we address those those challenges with AI solutions, especially with AI solutions? And I'm I'm not saying, or rather, we are not saying that AI is the only answer. It's just that we have focused on this in this webinar on AI. Of course, there are other complementary technologies, but today the AI being so hot, I think it's very relevant that we use AI to solve some of these challenges. And towards the end, we did see what it takes to do this, not just as a pilot, but at scale. So I hope this has been a good takeaway for our audience. And I do expect uh, a lot of questions to come by, especially around some of the use cases and the demonstrations that we've done. We would, we would love to go deeper into those conversations. Got it, got it, got it. All right, well, one of the questions that I see, and it's actually, Abhiram, you can take it or I, I can start it off, is have we worked uh, in with three PLs in pricing optimization uh, specifically, and I would say yes. We you know, have a number of dynamic price optimization accelerators, and we've worked with a number of not only trucking but logistics and shippers as well to help with pricing optimizations, taking in uh, various inputs from various data points, uh, helping them build out or augment what they already have from a pricing mm -hmm. perspective, but that is a large area where a lot of organizations are looking to focus in sharpening their pencil if they were. Uh, Abraham, do you have a, a, a viewpoint on that? Absolutely, yes. In fact, uh, pricing optimization or say pricing engine optimization as we call it is a, is a very relevant use case. We have been working with our clients in this space and the, the challenge or say the, the most important challenge here is it is influenced by a lot of macroeconomic and external factors as well. So that's the tricky bit. And, and that's where it's it's such an important use case because again, going back to the to the timeline view that I showed, um, you know, all of those events or at least majority of those events would have an impact on the fleet pricing, on the oil pricing, and accordingly they'll have an impact on pricing. So it's not just the customer demand or it's not just internal factors or say linked factors to your organization, but it's those macroeconomic factors which make that use case very interesting. And we we definitely work on that use case. Excellent, excellent. Um, another question I see here, uh, how have Gen AI solutions impacted the trucking industry? And that is a, a very long answer, uh, specifically, to use very specific use cases. One of the things that Abram just talked about was pricing and optimization, pricing efficiency, route planning. Uh, route planning is you know, one of Abram's favorite uh, uses because it is used across, I mean, it is a globally uh, desirable challenge because one of the things that you think about with route planning, it's not just the route planning at the beginning of the day, uh, trucks break down, um, yeah. shipments are late. Uh, you know, truckers, you know, sometimes uh, the carriers can't leave the warehouses on time because the materials haven't arrived. So they have to break that apart, put it away and then load the trucks. So you have dynamic route planning that has to occur. Uh, and then there's global shipping from logistics perspective, you know, whether you have warehouses, distribution centers, redistribution centers, last mile uh, uh, drop points cross docking and things along that line. When you begin thinking about freight planning, route planning, and how all of those things dovetail in together, uh, a lot of organizations uh, have found AI to be game changers because it really elevates those table stakes to these are the things that we have to do to stay alive. It's not about compatibility, competitiveness anymore. It's how do you stay alive? And so leveraging AI in that area has become extremely important. And one of the other last pieces I'll add uh, is that the technology, you know, the um, electronic logging devices, um, the tracker shipments, RFID, your reefer loads, uh, measuring and monitoring temperatures. Uh, as you pull in all of that data, 
and layer all of that data that was not intended to integrate. It wasn't intended to be put together in a single view. The uh, AI enabled solutions allow you to do that where you can pull in that information and you can predict uh, some of the challenges. Again, when you then pull in information around the geospatial information that Abraham mentioned, or you're pulling in events from traffic management for your long haul operators and whatnot, and you can find routes around construction or challenges. And not to be too specific, but when we had a bridge collapse in Cleveland, and um, I can't tell you the spike in demand that we saw with a lot of our clients saying, we now have to go around that bridge, that, that, that bridge collapse. How are we going to do that? How are we going to manage it? Because rates and dollars margins are tight and those fuel costs are going to go up as a result of taking longer routes. So Gen AI has really impacted that in a very, very positive manner. The negative side to it is that it has become more of a which solution, how do we leverage it? Because Gen AI, as you can imagine, is a big space. There are a lot of components that you have to think through, architecture styles, models, which types of model, how are you going to use it? What is the outcomes expected? So it has put some pressure on resourcing in the industry where a lot of resources are not familiar with uh, deep learning at that level and model construction and model architecture. So that is one of, I would say, one of the greater challenges. Abraham, do you have a perspective? Yeah, yeah. I, I like to add uh, two points here, right? So one is uh, generative AI as a, as a field as it has evolved. It has given us access to these foundation models and these large slash medium-sized language models. Now, one thing that we are we are observing, and this is not just for this use case for other industries as well, is we may be using the generation capabilities of these models to an extent, but more importantly, we are absolutely using the the whole processing capabilities of these models very effectively. So let's say let's take the traditional route optimization use case. You might have built those models in the traditional way. Uh, today, with generative AI coming in, you have much richer model or say richer models in place to do a lot with that aggregation of data, to understand that data really well, right? So that's how generative AI has helped us here. The second bit I'd like to address or say touch upon, and it's a topic and probably a webinar topic, Solomon, for us in itself, is the whole rise of agentic LLMs and agentic AI, right? So uh, the reason why I call this agentic AI out is, uh, it is now possible to use these this, this form of AI to handle exceptions. Right, so if this happens, what next? And if that also fails, what next? And there are these ways of uh, creating agents to, to handle different kinds of scenarios and, and do those tasks very effectively. Again, uh, it's, it's, it's a complex field in itself and we'd lo love to sort of decipher it separately, but that's another field of generative AI, which is which has evolved and which is very hot right now, which I think is very applicable to this industry because, because of its, it's requirement to deal with exceptions all the time. Agreed. No, and I think that's spot on. I think that's absolutely spot on. Uh, one question I see here, uh, we got a couple of minutes, we have six minutes. Uh, what is your take on build versus buy on AI solutions for the trucking industry? Uh, it, you know, again, it goes to organ one, it goes to your culture. There are many build cultures, organizations that are more build, there are many that are more buy. I'm not going to advocate that it's better to build or it's better to buy. It's better to look at your use case and the objectives and the outcomes. And it doesn't matter if you build it or if you buy it, you're going to have to do some uh, work around whether or not you're the pipeline feeding that data into that tool or how you're going to govern it, that's the internal component, how you are going to leverage the outcome of it and how you're gonna manage it and how you're gonna govern it. Um, there are tools that leverage some of the foundational models and LLMs that are out there. Uh, I would not advocate, the only thing I would not advocate is as your first initiative, as your first foray, building an LLM. That is very time consuming. It is very complex. 
if this is your first engagement and you're just getting into it, I would absolutely say leverage what's out there. Uh, because again, your business isn't LLMs. Your business is not um, these, these these tools and technologies. It's leveraging them so that you can do your job, so that you can focus in your area. But it depends on that solution that you're envisioning and what parts of that can you, what parts of that solution strategy can you support and where does it make sense to buy? That's my perspective. Abraham? No, absolutely. I think you've covered most of it. Um, and I would just say that, uh, you know, something that like you called out, it's the strategy of an organization. So we've seen enterprises strictly follow a build strategy versus those which which are comfortable with a buy strategy. So it's it's one enterprise strategy that drives it. Sure. Two, I think it's it goes back to my point on ROI and value creation, right? So in fact, this is something that we also follow when we are dealing with AI projects where we would evaluate solutions agnostically. So we, we of course work with a lot of our partners and we know there are, there are ready to ready to offer toolkits or platforms or products out there. And there are some clients who may have native cloud investments in Azure or AWS or GCPs, and there's an option to build. Now, what we typically do is compare the build versus buy in terms of the ROI that both options are generating. And based on the use case, based on existing investments, let's say if I'm an Azure shop with existing subscriptions, I have ready access to open AI libraries and that's where I'm just going to consume them rather than build something native. So that's how we go about recommending it rather than a, a, pointed saying, a point saying, yes, build is the best thing or buy is the best thing. Fair enough, fair enough. And uh, here is one more question. Um, I don't know if we're, I, I, I'm not, certainly not going to get to the rest, but just really quickly, <laughs> if I have to implement AI, where and how to begin? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, hi, very quickly, and I would advocate, please reach out. We can have a much deeper conversation about this. Uh, make sure you understand the use case. Make sure you understand the requirements in supporting that use case. Make sure that you have buyer, uh, your stakeholder buy-in and they understand it. And that it's something that you can, to Abraham's point earlier, something that you can prototype, you can learn from, you can uh, develop a, a longer term vision, understand its shortcomings, understand its limitations, but get a partner. And it doesn't, you know, again, we work with clients all the time. It, it's not billable. You just want to have a conversation. We can talk through what your objectives are. We can talk through where it is you're beginning. You can reach out to us, Abby, myself, Abby or myself, and we'd greatly love to help. Uh, but there's, it, it's more around understanding uh, the objective and the use case that you want to get into and validate that and make sure the value is there, make sure the juice is worth the squeeze. I know folks have heard that one before you actually start spending dollars and investing resources. Abi, do you have a perspective on that? I think you, you summarize it well. My only point there is, Solomon, the value chain that you showed earlier, that's a great way to identify where to start. So whenever this conversation, and I would really encourage uh, whoever asked that question to reach out to either of us, we would love to start from that value chain view, understand where your problem statements are, where your priorities are, and take it forward from there with everything that, that Solomon just called out. Fantastic. We are in the last minute. So in that last minute, I just want to say thank you to everyone on my behalf. I really appreciate you making the time to share, to, to help us share with you and you share with us your thoughts. Um, any of the questions that we didn't get to, we will directly answer. But I would ask also if you reach out on LinkedIn, if you have a specific question, if you want to send an email or you want to connect with us directly, Again, a conversation never hurts and there's never a, a cost or a billable or any expectation. Just reach out. We're happy to engage with you. We're happy to speak with you. Indeed. Thanks a lot. And thank you, Solomon. It's been great hosting this with you. I'll just say that we have a very short feedback form at the end of this webinar. I think our, our team will just launch it. Uh, we'll really appreciate whatever feedback you have, any, any specific pointers that you have. It will just help us improve our next set of sessions because there are going to be quite a few of these. I think, Solomon, you and I need to do a lot more of these for this Agreed. industry and for many others. Yeah, You got it, my friend. I'd love to do it with you. Abaram, thank you for joining. Yeah, It was yeah. great. And thank you for everybody that's out there that gave up their time. We hope it was valuable for you. 
Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.